Just after half past seven, welcome to everybody. I'm David Sawyer. I'm the chairman of the Friends of the South Downs. Um, we currently have well over 350 people on, so thank you very much for your support. I realized with so many people that most of you won't be members of the South Downs Society, so I'm just going to very, very quickly do an introduction to the society. Right, the South Downs Society started nearly 100 years ago, and we started to preserve, protect and defend the South Downs. Well, what are we doing in the interim? Well, the first thing we're doing is replacing a very large number of styles with kissing gates. Oh, yeah. Make sure that our, our members and their friends can actually use the South Downs. That's one of the gates we've changed. And we're very lucky to have the South Downs volunteer rangers doing them all for nothing. So we managed to do a lot more than we'd otherwise have been able to afford. We're going to fit some seats along the South Downs way. It's 110 miles from Eastbourne to Winchester. Just doing an introduction and then the guy can talk. A national park. <laughs> there are more planning applications for the South Downs than all the other parks put together. We examine all of those. I'm showing you an application for roads for Arundel A27, which has been a very much a hot potato recently. We're putting money into replacing trees. I mean, those numbers, I'll leave you, leave you to read it just for a moment. Horrendous numbers. 20% of all trees in the National Park will die. 90 to 98% mortality for the ash. Really, really horrible. And we're putting lots of money into replacing them. Now, that's all about the society. I'm showing you the, uh, the web page if you want to go and see more about us. Uh, two requests before uh, Charlie starts. Please don't unmute yourself because then we'll hear, just hear 380 wine glasses clinking in the background and that definitely won't work. <laughs> or perhaps for most of us, beer glasses, who knows. And if you've got a question, please use the chat to all facility at the bottom. It's the, bu it's the button that's at the bottom towards the right. And I'll collate them and then we'll use them uh, after Charlie has done the talk. So, welcome to Charlie, to Charles Burrell. Uh, I can't cool. tell you much about him because if I do, I'll give away the whole of his talk, which wouldn't work at all. Uh, but Charlie studied agriculture and advanced farm management at Sirencester, very well-known college. He inherited the Nepp Castle estate from his grandparents in 1983. And he was only in his early 20s. Really is amazing how much has been achieved since then. After that, I think I'll leave it to, to Charlie because I'm giving away the talk, as I say. So, thank you for coming. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and, uh, and invite Charlie to take it over. Hello, everyone. And, um, and such a pleasure to talk to so many people. Um, what I'm going to talk about is my experience of setting up the rewilding project at NEP. And I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about, perhaps just start off with, with what rewilding is, so you get a picture of that. Then a little bit of history of how uh, I've changed things on the estate. Um, I'm gonna then venture into how perhaps this could fit in lowland Britain. Uh, just give you some ideas of, of what uh, the government is talking about, what policymakers are talking about, what the world is talking about, and how we're going to have to do uh, things differently for the future. And so I'm going to place the sort of ideas about rewilding and how that's going to that's going to be part of our future. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of information on uh, finances, so you get a, a feeling of why why and how it's funded and how it's sustainable for an individual. Um, and then that will be wrapping it up after that. So that's my sort of plan, my game plan. I'm, I've been told that I've got 30 to 40 minutes to uh, talk to you all. And then, and then there, at the end of my talk, you've got uh, 20, 30 minutes where we can uh, discuss and look at uh, questions behind some of the things I've said. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is, um, if I can get the thing to work.
what is rewilding? I hope you're you're getting a, a the sound. I, I've put on the sound of a of a brown bear, a grizzly bear, and obviously for some people, rewilding is all about bringing back the apex predators into our landscape. But I'm guessing that that's a long way off. We haven't really got much room left in this country, wherever you look, where we can have these huge uh, uh, apex predators back in our landscape. I think it's not the problem of the apex predators not liking uh, being in Britain, but I think it's more to do with people. Uh, I don't know if you know that Germany, uh, for instance, has over 600 wolves now, even in, that, in the very small country of Holland with its huge population, the densest bit of uh, Europe, it has wolves back breeding. So I don't think it's not the wolves or the bears that is the problem, it's the people, and it's really making space for these animals in our landscape. And for me, I guess it's really restoring landscapes to a stage when these animals can live more naturally. And do we have enough space for that? I'm starting off with a graph. And this graph is, uh, was a, he calls it a cartoon. Sir John Lawton, um, who uh, you, many of you will have come across, the more bigger, better joined up, this living landscape idea, this space for nature report that government uh, commissioned from John uh, back in 2012. He came up with this cartoon to describe what he thought rewilding was. And it's quite useful just to get your head around this because here on the axis with uh, management intensity, you will see that there's a low management here and high management, you can see my cursor. And then you've got a scale at the bottom. And this is 10 to the power of two, 10 to the power of three. So these it's a, you know, a very, very long line. It's that, like that sort of image of where the sun is and the earth compared to the sun and Pluto. This is a very long line. And you've got in the right bottom hand corner, Yellowstone and Okavanga, those sort of big wilderness areas. The Palesi, just to give you an idea, that's, that's the land from the Chernobyl exclusion zone all the way into Boyevoja Forest um, along the Prepyat River. And that's about 5.4 million hectares. The Osvaldesplasm in Holland, which has become famous for its, uh, its, its experiment, uh, that's about 6,000 hectares. So that's the scale here. What John is saying in this is, this is where we sit at the moment. We have uh, one hectare, 11 hectares, 22 hectares. Quite a lot of the NGOs that come through uh, and, and I meet at NEP, I ask them how many, uh, how, what's the sort of average size of of bit of land that you manage or own. And it's usually in the range of 16 to 20 hectares. So we're really quite small little pockets of nature uh, that we're looking after, these little crown jewels. But also there's obviously bigger plot, bigger areas um, in the countryside which are looked after by private landowners and so on. Um, these SSI, SSSIs, these nature reserves and so on. But generally they're in this very highly managed uh, landscape. Uh, and you're managing it for protecting certain species that the designation has been given for the site. For instance, an SSSI may be given for two or three plant species or an animal or, or, or so on. And you then have to keep it in good condition for those, those plants or those animals. So here we are in Britain with these tiny little pockets of nature, which we have to manage and have to keep on looking after. The idea about rewilding is then traveling towards this bottom and this wilderness area. But we know that we can't get to these sort of scales of wilderness. So you're never going to reach the bottom right hand corner. You're going to, but you're going to attempt to get down there. And sort of NEP is here at 1400 hectares. Um, so very small little tiny pinprick as it were in terms of the scale of everything. But it's, it's got less management uh, and it's getting bigger. So that's the sort of the sort of overall arching idea is that you're you're attempting to give more space for these little pockets of nature by giving it them more land to then spread out to. NEP um, is, as I said, fourteen hundred hectares, and it sits uh, in West Sussex, down by the by Worthing, Brighton, Chichester, and Horsham. Horsham's our local town. Um, it's in one of the mostly, most densely populated parts of Britain. 
This is my um, uncle who uh, is still alive, uh, lives next door to me and has 1700 acres just next door. Here's my father and my aunts. And uh, this is them witnessing with uh, the family, the grubbing up of the, um, uh, the scrub that had grown during, uh, during the period between the two wars. So this part of Sussex in its, its heavy wheeled clay uh, is marginal land for agriculture. And, it was, and every time there's a depression, it then uh, goes back into a, a different mode. So what I'm gonna then talk to you about and what I'm gonna show you is not very much different from uh, other different periods in time uh, for this bit of the world. During the um, Second World War, this is the Canadian army that were based in the castle here. This is where my family and I live. Uh, and it sits in the middle of a Repton Park. And here's um, a bit of winter wheat growing in front of the castle. And that's part of a restoration, sorry, part of, uh, of growing and the war effort and the dig for victory, growing um, arable crops in, a re in your Repton Park. And part of that was we were being paid to remove veteran trees, for instance. So 60 pounds was, was the, the sum that government paid you to remove the veteran tree in your parkland so that you could grow crops more efficiently. So that huge dig for victory, that huge changeover, the way that we, we see, see our landscape and see our farming started to radically change during the war and after the war for nine years. Nancy, my daughter, who's sitting here on this wheat crop with me, this is 1995, and this is when um, we had a particularly good harvest. We had a very good European green pound rate, it was called. So the, so the grants that we were getting from Europe were very good, and we thought we had cracked it. Nancy now is doing a, a PhD at Oxford uh, and is 24 years old, and here I am looking much older and much, much, much more uh, bloated and saggy. Um, this is us sitting on this, this pile of wheat, and it was a moment of time when, you know, the, the fun and the joy of farming was when it went well, and you suddenly, you know, you, you, you had a great clean harvest, you had a, you, everything was going well, and the money was coming in, but most of the time it was pretty damn difficult and quite miserable. And this is why, um, this is the, uh, the low wheel, this is uh, heavy clay, 320 metres of clay cap over a, a bedrock of, of limestone. And this is my neighbor who still, still plows up and underneath the trees, and we were doing the same thing. We were farmers. We weren't managers of nature. We were, we were, look, we were trying to make money out of this, this dirt, this, this dirt that really is quite tough. Just to give you an idea, this is from 1972 to 1999, and this is the blue line is the average wheat, winter wheat yields for, uh, for NEP. And this is the average winter wheat yields for um, Britain. Now, we've gone through the green, it's called the green revolution. It's when, when the, plant, the plants people started to come up with really cool new crops. And we also started to come up with some really good new chemicals where we can control everything. And this revolution, we rode up this line. But NEP was never, because of its soil type, never going to be able to compete, even on an average of, of Britain. So we were two ton light of the average. If you think now, uh, in the last couple of years, you would have, uh, depending on your farming system, but you would have needed to, to be yielding eight and a half tons to 10 tons a hectare without grants or subsidies to actually make money you can see that we're well short of that. So there was, there was very little, I thought, prospect of us uh, competing on a world stage, uh, trying to sell commodities. This was um, another part of the business, which was uh, dairying, and we had 630 dairy cows, uh, and we were producing a lot of milk. But the dairy, uh, the dairy industry went for a huge radical change in the mid 90s, the milk marketing board going and so on, and the milk prices started to slide quite drastically. And I thought into the end of the 90s that my, that my future wasn't going to be farming. It wasn't going to be farming. So what to do? What would you do if, you, if you're not going to farm the land? Along comes this character here, the guy with the beard and, and the gray hair. He's called Franz Vera. 
and he wrote a book, um, a, a hypothesis, a study, a, a paper um, called uh, Grazing Ecology and Forest History. And this book I started to read in the, uh, uh, as soon as it was published in English in 2000. And I suddenly came up with the thought that what we could do with our land on this marginal land is we could look at some of the ideas that Franz Vera was coming up with. And those ideas were very radical. They were ideas that the science behind uh, looking after our ecology was wrong. And that science was all based on people like work, uh, like Sir Arthur, uh, Sir Arthur Tansley. And this idea from Tansley and others was that, the, the, that our temperate zone Europe had this straight linear progression from say uh, open grassland like this, if you left it, to nature, it would end up as a closed canopy woodland. And that closed canopy woodland would be your climax vegetation. What France then did is he, he, he tried to put back into that science um, large ungulates, large herbivores, which became the disturbers of that, uh, that linear progression. And he started to paint a picture, it was more uh, around a, a mosaic, a kaleidoscopic landscape. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. This is a list of one of the things you have to start to think about is what was here before. What were the drivers of our systems? What was the ecology? Uh, maybe even look at the interglacial period. So this is interglacial uh, and the last interglacial and this, uh, and this current uh, uh, interglacial period. So you're thinking about drivers. What, what, were the, what were the animals that now are extinct and what were they doing to our landscape? What were they doing to vegetation? So these are some of the ones that you would find in this part of Europe. But obviously there's a lot of them that are extinct. So the wild cattle and the wild horses, they're all gone. But we have proxies of them. We have obviously the elk, um, we have the wild boar, but they are both uh, considered to be dead dangerous wild animals. So they come under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, so you can't bring them back. So there's less and less options for you to use if you're going to uh, run a rewilding project. But the, there are proxies and there are some, uh, obviously, red deer and, and roe deer, a native species that would have been found here. So we then came up with this idea that we would look at um, introducing some of these uh, large herbivores into, into NEP and use them as drivers to create new habitats. We're not thinking about going back in time to the, you know, the middle of the wars or back into the 1560s or trying to create, we're trying to create new habitats that are good for life. And so you're using these drivers from where we are and seeing what they do to um, habitats going forward. Now, I hope this video works for most of you. Um, I'm sorry, I apologize if it's, not, if it's not streaming that well for some of you, but there's a video of, of Tamworth pigs. Tamworth pigs are keystone species of boar. They disturb the land. They are uh, real uh, drivers of systems. This is why we have the only growing population of turtle doves. This is why we have um, the largest population of purple emperor butterflies in Britain. These animals are keystone species. Then you have the red deer and the fallow deer and the roe deer. These are the heavy hitters, the heavy browsers. We know that they take, uh, uh, they do great damage to natural regeneration and they do great damage to understory and woodland. But in this system, what they're proving to be is the fight back. This sort of, you imagine there's this vegetation succession going along, and then you've got to fight that back if you don't want it to turn into closed canopy woodland. So these are the heavy browsers, the, the, the system that holds back that, that encroachment of trees. And all these trees are being protected, uh, that, that are growing up in this landscape by the thorny scrub. Then you have the Exmoor ponies and you have uh, an animal with a single stomach uh, with teeth on the top uh, they eat differently they move around the landscape differently they transfer different viruses than their cattle they are they are completely different herd structures so it's the nutrient transference the way they move around the landscape 
all different. We're not sure what traits they're giving to us, but we believe that they're, they're doing something um, in terms of driving different, different outcomes. Then you've got the old English longhorn. Now this is an old breed. We chose this old breed so it not only look the part, but it also would be able to live outdoors all year round without supplementary feeding. These animals aren't just um, grazing animals, they are browsing animals as well. They carry up to 230 different plant species in their gut, on their hooves, on their fur. These animals are all uh, contributing to uh, driving a new system, a new habitat that, uh, that other life can then uh, come in on. A kaleidoscopic uh, landscape, as Franz Vera calls it. So here we are, we start with uh, Nep looking uh, like this. I hope you can all see that. This is uh, the arable picture, uh, sort of end, end of the 2000s, maybe 2000 itself. Um, and then we've got this vegetation pulse. This We've allowed this land to, uh, to start to recover, uh, to grow its scrubland, to grow whatever is gonna come back in that landscape. I've got a, this is a, a, a timeline in a little corner of a field, just to give you an idea of what happens a little bit closer up. But all of this is happening because you are allowing, uh, allowing this scrub, this, the, 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 these changes to happen. And then you're putting in the animals to, to, to then stop it just reverting into a closed canopy woodland. Now it's slightly more complex than that because the picture I've just shown you is the southern block, this area down here, which is about 450 hectares. Then you've got the middle block. These are individually fenced areas where all the animals are trapped within. And we've removed 115 kilometers of internal fences. And then you've got the northern block. So the, the, the estate is split into these three areas. And then we have a regenerative agricultural um, uh, farm uh, in the area around the village itself. So the northern block has just got cattle in it and we allow we, we reseeded it or the arable with grasses and we then allowed uh, time for those those uh, the, the, the woody shrubby plants to start to come back into that grassland. This grassland has suppressed enormously the exuberant explosion that we'll, we find in the southern block. In the middle block, we have all the animals except pigs, um, and this has the highest stocking density. We're about to go through a, a big change. We're going to reduce the deer numbers that are around about 400 at the moment in this area down to just a few handfuls. And that's going to be for 10 years to see if we can encourage some of the trees and scrub to come back into that uh, parkland landscape. But it is a listed park, so there's there is uh, lots of other things to consider in terms of uh, this particular bit of landscape. Then you've got the southern block, and this is where most of uh, the excitements have happened. We came out of arable farming over a six year period, and then we introduced uh, the animals, uh, the big uh, grazing animals at the end of that six, six year period. So this has had time to respond. It has had time for the woody shrubby plants to grow and the trees to come up and then you've put the animals in as if there's been rinter pests uh, and it's wiped out the, the, uh, the native population of ungulates and then they've started to uh, slowly re rebuild as happened in Southern Africa. All of this has to be monitored and looked after. So um, we have uh, obviously achieved enormous things in very short uh, period of time. NEP has become uh, so famous is uh, because of its successes in bringing back life. And in such a short time, that gives us hope. So within 15 years, you have, you have recovered a whole load of animals that you just can't imagine. Uh, you know, when I started doing this, I just couldn't imagine any of this happening. I had no idea what was gonna happen. Monitoring, um, we've, uh, we have a, we have a full-time uh, an ecologist and we have lots of uh, surveys and so on that we do. We've done 30,000 records, 3,000 species uh, now, uh, 75 nationally notable scarce species and that keeps on building. We've now uh, got up to, I think, five either uh, new species to Britain or species that have uh, never been found in Sussex. So things are happening here which are extraordinary. 
74 BAP species. These are bio biodiversity action plan species. Now we've left, left Europe. That's going to change the terminology, but uh, that, uh, I'm still got an old slide. 22 red uh, list bird species. So it's really important that you, uh, you keep on monitoring and working out what's happening on the ground. This group of people, these are tourists over here. Um, this is in the center of the photograph is Tony uh, Davis. And this is our ecology team um, sitting around, uh, lounging around with, with bags of little birds. What they're doing is they've got nets up and they're catching birds. And Tony's got in his fist a bird and he's ringing it. And then they're released and then, and then we can then monitor where these birds turn up again. Just to give you some sort of idea of what this little team are finding is that they, they not only think that um, they have got to perhaps a record for uh, breeding songbirds in Britain, but these uh, migratory birds which they're catching here, the ones that are coming through the site are also in extraordinary numbers. If you read the bottom here, Tony, Tony um, has been ringing birds for 30 years um, over, the over a couple of weeks in September 2018, he ringed more lesser white throats, this bird here, and black caps in two fields on net than he ha has ringed his entire career. So not only has the songbirds and the African migratory birds come to nest here and to feed here and to, and, and to fledge here, but also the, uh, the, the importance of these sorts of sites for migration. Soil. Um, NEP uh, had a study done by uh, Laura uh, under, the, under Professor uh, Jim Harris at Cranfield, and she came up with this lovely um, finding. We were using a control of a neighboring farm that we used to own that's been carried on farming the way that we were farming, and the control to, to looking at what, what um, we were finding on our own ground after uh, 15 years was this total soil carbon more than doubled organic carbon more than doubled soil organic matter so on so these this recovery of the soil has been uh, one of the major things that we uh, are excited by i get really excited by dung beetles um I, I, I'm, I'm sure that some of you all <laughs> love the dung beetle but one of the things that uh, this study came up with was rather extraordinary she caught 12,178 uh, dung beetles uh, from NEP and two uh, organic farms six miles away in a day. And if you look at the results on that, we were looking at what the difference was perhaps in rewilded site with, con with continuous grazing, with animals outdoors all year round, with woodland open to animals. We were looking at that system compared to a, a, a com not conventional, but a organic, uh, a two organic farms. And that was the difference, an extraordinary um, finding uh, and done on the same day, same soils and so on. I'm just gonna quickly run through how, how I think that's all relevant for us uh, in planning uh, and policy making for, um, for England. And I'm gonna talk about lowland uh, England here. This is a photograph that I think is Shropshire, but I can't swear to it. I grabbed it off the internet. I've never been able to find it again. Um, what, I, what I wanted to look at um, was there was a, a book that was being produced by Dieter Helm, uh, the chairman of the Natural Capital Committee, and Dieter was talking about the green and pleasant land. And I wanted to talk about the green and pleasant land. And I wanted to then look at it with my eyes, that now that I know a little bit more about ecology, of temperate zone uh, Europe, I wanted to look at look at that landscape through my eyes. So here we have, uh, I think, this uh, immediately denuded landscape for me. You've got uh, hedgerows that cut to the quick. You've got um, grasses that have probably only got two or three species in them. You've got woodland that is only one species. The only good bit of nature left here has had a motorway put straight through the middle of it. You have a, a, a river system being canalized. You have uh, you have very little going on here that you can see there's space for nature and it's none of it is connected it's all fragmented there's nothing that is connecting this landscape i wanted to do um uh, wanted to look at this photograph uh, through the eyes uh, of um, a friend of mine uh, uh, jerome helmer who's a 
who's an ecologist, but also a wonderful artist. So I, we, we teamed up together uh, last winter and we put together uh, this slideshow. So what I'm wanting to, to get you to assume is that in these areas here is the sort of NEPs, the rewilded areas, maybe some, something, something much bigger than NEP and much, a much freer roaming NEP. Uh, maybe not, maybe similar to NEP, but those are your rewilding areas because I'm not going to talk about them now. I'm going to talk about the rest of the landscape. One of the things that John Lawton talks about uh, and, and the whole government policy is based on is we need to reconnect our landscapes. We have these, this crucial climate corridor idea. We have got a heating planet. We need to work out how uh, life can move around this landscape again. And so here's your, your, your climate corridor, but instantly you can see there's a problem. That problem is roads and fragmentation. So I've put in some green uh, bridges here. Uh, they're very common uh, in parts of uh, North America and uh, obviously Europe. Um, but these green infrastructure uh, is, is very poorly represented in Britain. I think we have about two and a half. The half one is really uh, because it's not functioning as it was designed. So I think as a society, we need to um, do a bit more of this. One of the things that in that landscape I was showing you was a hedgerows and hedgerows can be incredibly important uh, corridors. In this hedgerow alone, we have uh, three territories of uh, nightingales, 170 meters, three territories of nightingales, and we have dormice, dormice that have come back in here. Now, dormice are considered to be a coppice woodland uh, creature. We have got dormice now back into this scrubland. Then you've got the, um, the nectar, uh, the nectar friendly um, verges, the six meter virgins, verges and so on. And we know that this works. We know that uh, this actually functionally works as, as, a, as a great place for, res uh, for, for reservoirs, for insects and so on. So um, I think we should have more of that. And we know this because of work done quite a long time ago now um, Matt Hurd in this particular paper is, is on the advisory board at NEP, but this was looking uh, at, at the yields from a thousand hectare area uh, before and after giving space to nature and the yields in some crops went up. Overall, there was no change in yield. So we don't have to lose output of food uh, if we're going to give space to nature in this way. Then regenerative farming, and I, I'm sure you are now all familiar with the term, but this is probably the biggest revolution out of all of these things. Regenerative agriculture, when we can start to rebuild our soils. Once we get healthy soils and we have the biota back in our soils, what will it feed? What will it then support? I think, I think that's one of the most ex uh, exciting uh, parts of this journey that I've been on, is this, is this new sort of idea that we can rebuild our soils and not, not watch it being washed down to the sea. Uh, crucial reading here um, is dirt to soil, um, visit ground swell when it, this, this is a farmer's um, uh, uh, show, and then Call of the Rebarber by Charlie Massey, and then Growing a Revolution by J, uh, David Montgomery, all very worthwhile uh, picking up their books. So regenerative agriculture, agriculture very much part of this landscape producing uh, sustainable food. Wood pastures, I've always been very keen on, on wood pastures and the government at the moment for, for countryside stewardship can, uh, can fund wood pasture, it's called WD6, creation of wood pasture, and it's very much based on the, the net model, allowing scrub to come back up, allowing the scrub to protect trees, allowing that, those areas to have uh, animals at the heart of it. And the technologies, technologies that are coming with that if you see this uh, collar around this cow's head, that's a no fence uh, collar. That's a, an invisible uh, electric fence line that you can draw on polygons on Google Earth and you can then control your animals within a given area. Technology that's gonna revolutionize a lot of uh, downland as well. So this, uh, the next stage is the, the, the re-wetting up of the, the, the floodplains and here we've got Jerome doing an amazing job. He's got the beaver here. He's got a lynx uh, stalking the beaver. He's got the cattle. He's got people canoeing through here. He's got a braided river system. He's got woody debris blockages. He's got elk. 
anyway, fantastic. I love, I love his imagination. Um, but we know that we can do better with our systems. I think there's only 16% of our rivers are in good condition, 16% in Britain. That's appalling. We can do a lot better. On NEP, we, um, we re-meandered a river system about two and a half kilometers long. Um, and that was at the time, the biggest restoration of a floodplain in Britain on private land. Isn't that mad? What a tiny little bit of work actually, but wow. Um, now we're gonna watch it uh, transform into something extraordinary. So we go from our wetlands, um, we then look at uh, how the food is going to be produced. So we've already talked about regenerative agriculture. This, this landscape is full of food production still, but it's been done in a sustainable way. But I think there's going to be more needed to be done. So I've got here, um, uh, just to add, that this, this, uh, this idea that we've lost 98% of our rich uh, swords, here's a sword that is coming back. And this is, this is, a, this is a human construct. This is uh, hay meadow systems that, uh, that will produce high fluidic value, but we need some of that. But we also need to produce food. So I've put into this landscape uh, greenhouses. Um, you probably all have heard about precision fermentation, precision biology. That's the, the latest ideas that we're going to be getting our proteins and carbohydrates to add to foodstuffs uh, from fermentation vats, uh, if you like, yeasts producing these things. Uh, fly farming and so on. So all these things are coming and they will be producing carbohydrates and proteins for either animal feed or for feeding humans. So all of this I, the complexity of where the food's gonna come from and where we can get food security is gonna be um, this, this whole myriad of pictures. But at the heart of it, I believe that we need to have uh, enough space for nature to support all of it. One of the things that um, uh, we're really interested in the moment because there's about 600 million about to be spent on encouraging us to plant trees may make more spe uh, space for trees is these uh, is how we're going to how we're going to uh, uh, allow that into our lives and this is natural regeneration for me it's maybe continuous canopy forestry as a method of of, of uh, taking timber it's not no longer thinking about um, uh, single species plantations anyway i better rush through so that whole picture uh, for me is how we can rebuild and revitalize both nature and uh, integrate that nature within a farming system that will be sustainable and, and healthy for our soils going forward. Money. Um, for me, I, I, I know we started a bit late, I'm running a bit late now, but I'm just coming to the end. Um, for me, uh, what we've done here, this is looking at a partial budget on the estate. So the estate is three and a half thousand acres. We're looking at just the land here. We're not looking at the uh, other assets that the estate has. So we're sort of isolating the farm assets and then seeing what that looks like with the changes we've made. So one of the things we've done is we've managed to get environmental stewardship and we get 220,000 uh, pounds a year year from um, environmental environmental stewardship we get uh, another two hundred thousand pounds from uh, the royal payments agency and a basic payment and that's the thing that will be disappearing over the next uh, five to seven years so that will be gone so how do we replace that money to to make the whole thing work still what we've done is we've converted a lot of farm buildings um, uh, to other uses and that, those little other, other businesses that are now using those buildings, uh, they employ 200 full-time jobs. So job numbers have gone up. The estate itself employs more people than when we were farming as well. So employment, local employment definitely goes up by doing this. Um, we also don't have to house uh, key personnel. So we don't have to house the stockman or the dairyman any longer or the farm manager. Um, so that has released a whole lot of uh, cottages that we can then rent out to other people. Uh, we produce 75 tons live weight from the area. Uh, this we're converting into um, added value now, but this figure here is just the, the, the wholesale uh, price that you're selling, 120,000 pounds, that 75 tons. Uh, we hope to turn that into about half a million, uh, three quarters of a million by adding value to it. So we've got a website now that sells 
our meat, uh, and we hope that that will work. Tourism, damping and camping, um, now that has been extraordinary for us. We've only been doing it for five, six years. We are now uh, fully booked up a year in advance. Um, it's replaced entirely the profit that the farm used to make. Um, we used to be cash negative, but profit making of about 150,000. So that camping uh, and glamping and tourism and safaris has been astonishing to us. And it's been a revolution, revelation. And people can come now uh, on a safari with a, a guide who is a, an, a, an ecologist with deep knowledge, and it's absolutely just brilliant. Uh, education and fun and just seeing a new landscape. So really proud of that particular thing. The thing that's given back to me is an enormous amount of time. When you uh, come away from a loss-making uh, business and you start to rebuild your future with things that actually make money and that allows you to do lots of other things. And that's what I'm doing now. I sit on a lot of boards. I sit on, I this particular one um, here, very proud of the Endangered Landscape Programme. We hand out to, up to 5 million to projects all around Europe. Um, Arcadia, we give away 120 million a year. This is the, the Rousing Family um, Foundation. Um, and uh, Foundation uh, Carpathia, this one here, um, we're building a national, hopefully turning a, a, a part of the Carpathian Mountains into a huge national park. So I'm really excited by lots of things that are happening in Europe from, from the involvement that I'm having from just this idea of rewilding. That's it for me. Um, I'm going to hand back to, um, to David and uh, stop sharing the screen. Uh, I, 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 this is my wife's book. I had to plug it anyway. Okay. David, I'm back to you. Okay, thank you very much. What a brilliant and inspirational talk, I must say. I was just so impressed. If, if you wouldn't mind going down to your chat at the bottom there, Charles, I've sent you a personal chat message with okay, some questions. Okay, I've got it. Yeah? Yeah. And I'm handing over to our trustee, Glyn, who's going to take it from now on. But if you could answer the questions, that would be a big help. So um, to what extent do you apply checks... Uh, on the population of animals to match winter carrying capacity. Really interesting, isn't it? So what we did is we started with low numbers of the different animals, species. And we then allowed the population to grow. And then we got to a stage about five years ago where we thought we had overdone it. We'd, we'd got too many. And you're not responding to instant things like a really wet winter, um, one year you've got to look at it over you know two or three years have you have you got too many over two or three years and what we then did is we then brought back in one area by 10 percent and another area by 20 percent uh, and we then have gone forward with that to see what that feels like but of course the land is changing the whole time the the vegetation is changing the the soil condition is getting better so uh, there's a constant change in the ability for the land to, to withstand these animals um, on the land all year round. Um, the, other, the other thing that you're, you're then playing with is which species do you have and what quantity? And that's very difficult to gauge. But you know, if, you, if, you, if you set, what we did is we thought, well, okay, we don't want any less than 20% woodland and scrub cover. And we don't want any more than 40% wood and, and scrub, uh, scrub cover. So you set yourself a parameter and then, uh, and then you can start to think, well, we need to up the heavy browsers because it's too much scrub uh, uh, migrating into the open spaces and so on. So that's the tricky bit. It's that, that but you know, that's what a land manager does. Um, we're, all, we're all able to know what our land looks like. And, and you know, if you're wanting and chalk uh, downland, you're maybe wanting completely different outcome. You're, you know, you're wanting much less scrub and trees, and you're wanting more, uh, more downland species. And and maybe you're after, um, you know, the uh, uh, pulse grazing so that you have the chance for the grasses and the wildflowers to to flower for them to then be grazed later on in the season and so on. So all of these things are part of the the, the sort of management structure that you're going to have to come up with because it is that's the bit that you are managing. Uh, another one I've got here, will you cull the deer or more? Or more uh, 
So the deer numbers, um, without the deer, we would be on our way to being a close country woodland. So without that heavy hitter, we would be turning into a woodland. Now, woodland is wonderful, um, but in terms of biodiversity and species, it's very much a poor, poor uh, example of what we're going to want to head to. Uh, scrubland, this, this mosaic that we've created, is where the most biodiversity you're going to get. If you look at uh, some of the long-term experiments uh, at Woodland, um, some of them have been going on for 40, 50, 60 years. If you were leaving Woodland just to get on with it, what you end up with is a, a Woodland with lots and lots of fungi, but not much else. So, um, you know, the, the, the control of the deer is to do with the amount of browse that we're needing to keep it enough of it open to give us that sunlight uh, hitting different plant species. So I hope I've answered the income of uh, after rewilding. I mean, you know, there, there's obviously a huge, a huge um, story to, to talk about in, in, in the, the financial uh, and, and, and there's huge changes coming. And there's going to be um, a really complex uh, period in time when we're trying to work out uh, what, which way to jump. And uh, those of you who are farmers or landowners, um, we're all watching really keenly on what, what ELMS is going to mean to us uh, and what perhaps net gain is going to mean to us and what the polluter pays principle is going to mean to us. Um, the voluntary carbon market, the, the, uh, the DEFRA metric, which is going to they come up with uh, a mixture of carbon sequestration and biodiversity uh, gain. And all of these things are up in the air at the moment and, and in flux. And so um, I would encourage all of you to uh, engage in this discussion and uh, make your voices heard about your, your vision for the future because it is in flux and the government is absolutely in listening mode. Uh, to what extent do you apply checks to the populations of animals to match water, winter carrying? Oh, it's the same sort of question, isn't it? Sorry. Oh, that is a repeat of the question. Uh, can the book titles be shared in the chat, please? Um, that's up to you guys. Um, that's very happy. I mean, um, and it's definitely worthwhile um, having a screenshot of that and something and set, sending it on. I, I, I could do that, David. I'll send it to you and, and you can send it on. And we'll get it on the website, perhaps. Yeah, okay. Um, would love to hear more about how the river is meandered if there's time, please. The, the river restoration project was really quite, it was quite quite difficult to, to achieve that. It took about 20 years of, of talking and persuading and getting to the point when we had the funding to then do it. And so what we did is we had, we had, um, a, a, a shadow of the old meandering river in the flood plain. And we, um, and we then decided that what we wanted to do was to fill in, uh, if you can see my hands, fill in the canalized river that was running through that flood plain, which is shaped like that in profile. And we wanted to fill it in and then have a much shallower profile with a bit of summer, summer flow in the bottom of it and then winter flood flow above it. But basically getting the, uh, the water much closer to the floodplain. And that meant that when it did rain, um, that the, fl the, the, the flood waters would come down and spill out into the floodplain. And the floodplain would then be reunited with that, that, that uh, river system. So that was the basis of it. But we also wanted that when it flooded out of the floodplain, that it would then sit on the floodplain for long periods of time. So we then created a whole lot of scrapes where the water would then sit. Of course, we're talking about um, clay here. So, you know, any hole you, you build, it will, it will fill up the water and stay there for a long time. So it that was the sort of, um, sort of uh, thing that we were doing uh, for, the, for the river restoration. And upstream of that, we've then done uh, um, eight and a half kilometers of restoration of the small tributaries coming into the main river. And we've also got a license to release beavers. Um, so, uh, so we're going to have a lot more action with a whole load of uh, beaver action, uh, building dams and so on in that river system, uh, controlling that water system uh, and holding that more and more on net uh, and letting it trickle down and through the system. 
Um, David, I'm not sure what other what other. Uh, well, I've summarised. Even as you've been speaking, as always happens with interesting talks, you get loads and loads of questions. There's a couple about beavers. Are you intending to introduce beavers? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, what we've been granted is a license um, to release. It's a new type of license, and it's to release beavers into uh, a, a 250 hectare area. And the license was um, we only had to build a partial fence. So we had to build fences that were 50 meters away from any watercourse coming into the site or leaving the site. Um, we then brought down some Tay bee beavers about a month and a half ago, and we put them in, they weren't a pair, and we put them into this 250 hectare site. And the immediate thing was that the female decided to go upstream and the male went downstream and both of them went straight out of the site. Uh, one ending up uh, almost down to the sea, and then he came all the way back up onto another another arm of the Ada. We caught him back up again, and then the female went up upstream um, and uh, went uh, went exploring in some fishing ponds around an old brickworks. So it wasn't terribly successful our, our venture into this. So we've now um, had to modify our thinking, and we've had to think what we're going to have to put different structures on the on the external the, the big uh, perimeter fence and we're then going to put a, a builder holding pen which will be temporary for a couple of years put the beavers in there let them settle let them produce kits let them build dams and then remove the the, the temporary fence and allow them into the bigger area and see if that works but that's the plan <laughs> Oh, very good. Thank you. One or two about visiting. Can you, can, obviously lots to say, can you visit? So, yes, I mean, uh, it's been astonishing in lockdown. Um, you know, uh, at this time of year, I wouldn't recommend it. We're on the low wheeled, and I don't know if you know the word low wheeled, but for those that do, uh, I think Izzy has in her book, I think something like 32 different names for mud. Um, the, 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 uh, the footfall that we've had because of uh, COVID and because of uh, net becoming more and more in the, in, in view, uh, it's been uh, slightly shocking. Uh, but anyway, we have lots of footpaths, but we also have um, this safari business. Uh, so you can book uh, on a safari. We take out small groups, uh, mostly walking safaris, going out with an expert, uh, or you come on a land a landowner um, workshops. We do small scale and we do large scale workshops uh, for people that want to learn a lot more about it. And we, we talk about the figures and facts and go into a lot more detail. So if you look on, on the web, website, if you type in NEP, K-N-E-P-P, -P, you'll come up with, with lots of different websites and, uh, and hopefully find your way around it. There's a huge amount of information that I've put on the, uh, the rewilding website as well. So if you want to learn more, and obviously there's rewilding Britain and rewilding Europe and a whole load of other uh, places that you can find out more about this subject. Okay, there's obviously a bit of concern about getting on one of your safaris, so I think South I'm Down... Afraid I afraid we, we, we release them at the end of uh, each season, and I'm afraid, you know, the, just the nature of it, we, we run out of space so quickly. We try to put more on during the season, but it's really, you know, you sort of, there's a sort of limit to the capacity, and we want to keep them small, and we want to keep them you know, so that people can ask the deep questions and, and, and have an immersement into nature. So I'm afraid it just is, is you know, it is like that. I'm, um, I don't know. I don't know. We, we, we don't know quite what to do. Um, let's hope there's going to be lots more rewilding projects with the same sort of ethos and, and the same sort of things going to be um, promoted and the same sort of safaris. Because um, we've obviously got Ken Hill, which has started, um, and we've got uh, other ones that are, uh, and, um, uh, uh, Jim Lowther at, uh, at Lowther Castle has started. So there's a whole load of other, other uh, uh, people that are, uh, are beginning the journey. And so there will be more and more places that will have this ethos and this idea uh, to go and have a look at. So it won't be just on us, I hope. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that you will give your friends in the South Down Society a bit of priority here. I think Laura, we could be arranging a trip, surely. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we do. We also do bespoke things. So if, if societies and and uh, NGOs and and charities and so on, we do a lot of a lot of trips around um, 
uh, for that as well. So, so if there's if there's people that are wanting to group together and come on uh, a bespoke, uh, you know, we can design it around you. Uh, we can do things like that. I mean, we have we uh, all, all the time. I'm saying there's a caveat there. We are limited because we just there is only a certain amount of days in the week, uh, and it's all crunched into the summertime. Walking around NEP in the winter is difficult. Okay, I think we can rely on that. Right, uh, just perhaps finally, because we've had loads of questions, and I do thank you for it. Uh, there's a couple of questions about people who want to rewild their garden or 10 acres, you know. How practical is it for, for a small area? Completely fascinating, isn't it? Because one thing that we sort of, our, I was off the ball a bit. Um, we have a, a, a wall garden here. And we've been gardening very conventionally, you know, vegetables, but, you know, but flower beds and so on. And we have, um, we have, we have just started um, to think about how to rewild it. And so we've employed um, Tom Stuart Smith, a very famous landscape architect, um, and a couple of uh, professors, uh, botanists. And we are in the process of thinking what it means to rewild a garden. And the garden is important. It's, it's still a garden. So it's a place that you are gardening, you're going out to enjoy you know, time. And, but how do you actually rewild a garden? So I think there's a really interesting thing that are gonna come from this. Um, and, and again, um, there's a lot of other people. And Dave Goulson's book um, uh, is very good to read about how to rewild your garden. So th there is lots of information out there. And I think, if you can think in, in the way that I've just described natural processes being driven by herbivores and pigs and everything, and then think how that can be applied to your smaller area, that's where it becomes interesting, isn't it? Because you can be the pig, you can be the rootler, you can be the, 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 the browser, you can, you can clip your, your uh, thorn so that it behaves a bit more like uh, like a browse, but a thorn. You can allow that tree to uh, germinate and, and grow. You can have the, those long grasses and then cut them back as, as, as if you sent in your grazing animal. So I think it's thinking like that and, and having that, that, that um, kaleidoscopic uh, vision of, you know, not, not, nothing's uniform, nothing's edged. Nothing, it's, it's all margins, it's all it's all bleeding in from one place to another. There's, there's lawns uh, for the species that like lawns. There's the, you know, it's, it's that thinking. I think that's what's so fascinating uh, to think all the way through to, to whatever size. And it's just a, it's, a, it's, it's rewilding yourself. It's that, that, sort of, um, that sort of thought pattern. Okay. Now I think you're running out of breath now, aren't you? <laughs> Somebody is right, last one then perhaps. That somebody's very keen to know if you think there's a, spl a place for sheep in your Yes, I th absolutely. I think, I th think it's just the, it's the quantities, isn't it? You know, uh, if you're a sheep farmer, you know that your sheep are incredibly good at, um, they've got the, those little mouthpieces that can, uh, 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 that can find the, the, su the succulent uh, plants. So they're very good at eating out um, certain species. So, you know, time and and quantity are a problem, I guess, with the amount of time that the sheep are in any one spot, and the, and, and the, and the amount of sheep you have uh, can be a problem for certain plant species, can't they? So um, for me, um, you know, if you looked at the sort of upland, uh, uplands, I would say more cattle, uh, less sheep. I would say those uh, wonderful hefted sheep ought to be part of the future. Uh, I would say uh, that no longer should you be um, grazing so tightly that there is no natural regen uh, coming up in, in that landscape. And we know that the uplands and the highlands can uh, regenerate with trees and scrub. Uh, and in time, if you allow, allow that to happen, you can then uh, go back up in numbers of these, these grazing animals. Because we like, uh, we, you know, there are, you know, there absolutely is a need for the short crop lawns, the 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 the, the, the um, species that are uh, targeted by sheep. Uh, but yes, um, absolutely, sheep can be part of it. Okay, thank you. We really are getting in, in inundated with questions now, as you can see, probably for yourself. Um, 
Well, I, 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 you know, I just made the last one. Age 51 and your story at Met has inspired me to return to college. Well, great. I, 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 when you get back to college, whoever you are, um, uh, invite me to come and talk to the bloody college. Because <laughs> that's one thing that really is, is desperately needed is, um, is, is actually, in, you know, the colleges, the universities to engage more in this. Um, fascinating to see how behind they are in regenerative agriculture terms and in, and in, and in thinking. Um, I'm really, uh, really surprised by some of them. Um, anyway, do invite me. <laughs> right. I, I, there are so many. <laughs> I've just read that. Oh, uh, right. David, well, I know. Yes. But, uh, I mean, what what sometimes uh, is useful to do is is collate them all, and then and then we can uh, uh, maybe answer some of them at a later stage. But. Um, well, is, would it would it be appropriate for me to just make a list for you of the of the key ones? Because some of them are I can't repeat. promise that. I mean, I, I remember I'm doing this maybe um, a, a once or twice a week. <laughs> so, right. So I, you know, the 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 answers I can't really, uh, but I, okay, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes it's quite good for the group to to uh, to talk talk amongst each other, and that's what we've done in the past as well. Is actually have people. Uh, able to go onto forums and there is a there is for instance a forum for rewilding on uh, rewilding britain um and they welcome uh, anyone to come and talk and and chat between between uh, each other and because lots of answers are going to be answered by people within the group itself uh, you don't need uh, idiots like me um trying to answer everything um i've only got partial answers to 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 anyone's situation Right. Okay. In that case, I'm going to pass over to Glyn, who I hope is somewhere with his um, unmuted. Excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that you can't see me. I don't, I don't know what's happened to my camera today. It was fine yesterday, but there you go. You haven't come to see me. Um, Charlie, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, particularly, I, I spent the last 40 years managing countryside for the National Trust in West Sussex, and uh, I just love everything you said. Um, I was especially struck by your message of hope. It's really unusual these days to hear growth in populations of rare and threatened species. And that's such good news. And it's exactly the sort of thing we need in these troubling times that we're going through at the moment. On behalf of the Friends of the South Downs and the massive audience that you've attracted tonight, I'd like to thank you for sharing your achievements with us in such an informative and entertaining way. And we are very happy to be able to tell you that we'll be donating a thousand pounds from tonight's takings towards funding the continuation of the exciting work that you and your teams are doing at NEP. Together with the interest you're raising and the influence you're exerting here in the United Kingdom and across the world. You keep up that excellent work and we look forward to you returning to updates on the progress of your project at some time in the near future. And if you folks in the audience who are not already members want to help us, the Friends of the South Downs, to support projects like this one and many others within the National Park, log on to our website again and become members of society. So once again, thank, thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you, people, for coming to listening and just keep up the good work.